We are talking about moving forward in a backwards world. Today we're going to talk about political correctness gone wild and how it permeates and infiltrates every bit of our society, not just in the United States, but across the globe. And we would need to remember that um, Peter recognized this even back in the time of the apostles, that this world wasn't our world. As a matter of fact, this world is an evil world. We talked about that last week, that uh, inherently uh, society and humanity uh, is not focused on God. They're focused on themselves and they're focused on things. That's really what idol worship is all about, putting something else above God. And political correctness is a way of, of in fact... Um, making sure that people aren't focused on God, that they're focused on everything else that the world is saying is important right now other than God and worshiping Him. Now, we know one day that this world will pass away and that the next heavens and the next earth will be a blessed place, a wonderful place, a perfect place that we can spend eternity. But until then, we're stuck with this world, and we have to live in this world, and we have to navigate this world, and we have to do our best to impact this world one person at a time. In First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, such as war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Well, isn't that exactly what happens? The world is saying the things that are right are wrong. And the things that are wrong are right. They're accusing us of being hateful when we try to stand up for biblical truth. They are accusing us of being intolerant while we try to stand up for what we believe. They accuse us of, of being unfair when we're simply trying to be faithful to what we believe. Now, in a lot of places, at a lot of times, Christians have earned those accusations because they have not done a good job of loving. But see, we can love and still not accept the things that the world says are right. We can love the people in the world. We can, we can love those human beings who are engulfed in evil. We can, we can interact with them. We can be a part of their lives to share the, the love of Christ. But it doesn't mean we have to have to do what they do or accept what they do. We have to stand alone. Peter says that we are aliens and strangers in the world. Now, I'm not sure if any of us are true immigrants from another land. There might be one or two among us that are. I don't know your story, possibly. Okay? But we know over the last several years and certainly several decades, that the impact and influx of individuals from other places wanting to be in other places has impacted economies, has impacted cultures, has impacted educational systems, has impacted governmental infrastructures all across Europe and even in the United States and North America. Okay, we understand that. There are aliens and strangers seeking something better. Well, that's exactly what Peter says we are. He says you are, in fact, aliens and strangers intended to be somewhere else. And you will get there, but you are, I think one of the other versions uh, of the scripture says, you are sojourners or you are sojourning or you are traveling through this foreign land. Don't become 
like those you travel through. Don't adopt their bad behaviors. Don't adopt their foreign philosophies. Don't be like them. Be a part. They will accuse you of political incorrectness. They will accuse you of intolerance. They will accuse you of hatred. But stand for the truth and continue your journey. Political correctness definition is a term that describes language, ideas, policies, and behavior seen as seeking to minimize social and institutional offense in occupational, gender, racial, cultural, sexual orientation, religious belief, disability, and age-related contexts. Discrimination is wrong, flat out. Someone should not be discriminated out in the economy for the way they believe, the way they look, the way they dress, the way they orient themselves. I totally believe that, 100%. All right? But on the flip side of that, we should be able as individuals in this country to hold on to belief structures and systems even in the midst of recognizing that discrimination is wrong. We should be able to say, I understand that that shouldn't keep you from being an accountant or a teacher or a physician or a garbage collector. But it doesn't mean I have to accept what you believe or how you live. You might be a great accountant. You might even do my taxes. But don't make me accept your lifestyle. You're you, and I'm me, and I can believe what I want. But political correctness says you can't. See, that's where it's gone too far. It's gone from something good, which actually worked to protect even faith-based people, to something that now itself discriminates. I've got some examples of political correctness gone Wild. You all know that um, people all around America, particularly in Europe especially, are cracking down on public expressions of Christian faith. Yet atheists in New York City are allowed to put up a billboard that says, keep the Mary, dump the myth. Talking about let's keep Santa, but let's get rid of Jesus. That's all right. But if a Christian puts up a billboard that says Jesus is born in Bethlehem, it won't stay up a week before somebody complains and they take it down. According to the Equal Opportunity Commission, it is illegal for employers to discriminate against criminals because it has a disproportionate impact on minorities. Well, what the government is saying is that the minorities are the criminals. That's not necessarily the case. The government itself has determined that these people are bad people, but because they're bad people, we can't discriminate against them when we're hiring. Portland, Oregon, a school official served up a controversy in September 2010 when she suggested that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches carry racist connotations. Anybody want to tell me how that works? Because minorities or immigrants may not be able to afford peanut butter and jelly. So by allowing your child to bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to school, it tells these other children who can't afford peanut butter and jelly that they're less important than you. Last time I looked, peanut butter is pretty easy to get. So is jelly and white bread. Not very expensive. Another example of political correctness taken too far 
This is in Europe, where the council in Kent banned the term brainstorming. They replaced it with thought showers because they thought brainstorming might offend epileptics. Ah, I don't even get that connection. Reliable and hard working, surely two keystone traits employers look for an employee, right? Maybe not in Europe again. A recruitment agency told his employees that they could not request these qualities. They said such an advertisement might be un- offensive to unreliable people. Or lazy people. No, I'm not looking for a hard worker. I'm looking for somebody really lazy. I guess they need jobs too, but last time I checked, lazy people didn't want them. Volunteer chaplains in Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department have been banned from using the name of Jesus on government property. That's very common nowadays. When high school in California, five students were sent home for wearing shirts that displayed the American flag on Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is Independence Day for Mexico. Well, by wearing an American flag, apparently they offended all of the Mexicans in their high school, or that was the thought. They were sent home to change their shirts. Chris Matthews on MSNBC recently suggested that it is racist for conservatives to use the word Chicago. I don't get it. I've been to Chicago. I lived in Chicago. Why can't I use the word Chicago? The European Parliament introduced proposals to outlaw titles stating marital status, such as Miss or Mrs., as to not cause offense. And that, of course, would be extended to Madame and Mademoiselle, Frau and Fraulein, Senor and Senorita. They would all be banned. Florida Atlantic University student that refused to stomp on the name of Jesus was banned from his class by his teacher. A school in Seattle renamed Easter eggs Spring Spheres to avoid causing offense to people who do not celebrate Easter. In America today, there are many groups that are absolutely obsessed with eradicating every mention of God in the public sphere. Elementary school in North uh, Carolina ordered that a six-year-old girl remove the word God from a poem she wrote to honor her two grandfathers who served in the Vietnam War. Six, is that second grade or first grade? First grader. Telling them, you can't say God. A high school track team was disqualified earlier this year because one of the runners made a gesture thanking God once he crossed the finish line. I actually have a copy of a note here sent home with a student from a teacher. It's addressed to the parents, dear Daniel and Sarah. We noticed that Laura had a Wonder Woman lunchbox that features a superhero image. Keeping with the dress code of the school, we must ask that she not bring this to school. The dress code we established requests that children not bring violent images into the building in any fashion or their clothing, including shoes and socks, backpacks and lunchboxes. We have defined as violent characters any of those who solve problems using violence. Superheroes certainly fall into this category. I remember my G.I. Joe lunchbox. I also remember the bully stomping on it at the bus stop when I was in second grade. Why aren't they more concerned about the bullies than they are the lunchboxes? Because the bullies have rights. Now... I am not one that goes overboard with my vehemence against political correctness. I recognize that some are very appropriate at times. 
There are times where certain things should or shouldn't be said or certain images should or shouldn't be shown. I recognize that. But people take it overboard when a child can't bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to school or carry a Wonder Woman or a Superman lunchbox. See, it goes back to our point from last week that the world is filled with evil and evil will remain in the world until the judgment. We're stuck with it. We are not going to win the war against evil. But what we can do is win battle by battle by battle each and every day. Two, two of the uh, parables that we see in uh, the scriptures, Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares, is the story about the farmer who sowed his, his seed out in the field. And as the seed began to, to grow, uh, his servants noticed that there were weeds in among the wheat as well. And, and they said, someone has come in, in in the middle of the night and sown weeds in the middle of the field. Shall we go and shall we pull them out? He said, no, D- don't pull them out. He said, if you pull the weeds, you'll also pull some of the wheat. Let's wait till harvest. Let's wait till the end. The the picture we have here is God addressing somebody about evil in the world, whether it's his angels or, or a prayer. And God says, I recognize that there is evil in the world. I recognize that the devil is at work. But the plan is to let it all grow together until the end. And then we'll separate that. And what happened in the end of the parable? The wheat was gathered and put into the barn. And the weeds were burned and destroyed. The same thing that we see throughout the scriptures. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 is uh, the picture we have of the sheep and the goats, a judgment. This is the wheat and and the weeds right here at the end, where they are separated, righteous from the unrighteous. Whether the unrighteous were claiming righteousness or the righteous were saying, I'm not really sure how I ended up over here. But thank goodness I'm in this line. And the righteous entered eternity and glory, and the unrighteous went to the fiery death. So we've got to recognize that we cannot eradicate all evil from the world. And political correctness is is a way that the world is using to distort truth and to turn truth into evil in so many things, especially with our children in school. And that goes up to even college. Where they're being told what they have to believe if they want to fit in. They're being told how they have to act if they want to be a part. And it's hard for children, whether they are 2 or 22, to be able to say, no, that's not what mom and dad taught me. That's not what I learned in children's church. That's not what I understand the Bible to say. They are confused because authority figures are telling them that they're bad and that they're wrong and that they need to do things differently. See, but what we have to do is we have to live verse 11 of our scripture this morning, which says, live such good lives among the pagans that they, though, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Although they may accuse you of being harsh, although they may accuse you of being haters, although they may accuse you of being intolerant, although they may accuse you of standing against the norms, if you are living a life that is faithful to Christ, even in their accusations, they will see the truth. Picture here I have is of Jesus uh, as, they, as, as the Israelites are gathering to stone the woman caught in adultery and Jesus comes on the scene and they are accusing her, accusing her uh, of the sin and, and the right penalty is stoning. What began to happen? As Jesus began to kneel and write in the sand, 
there are books written on what he wrote in the sand. No one knows. He uses that one infamous line. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. See, the the reason that the world wants to be angry at us, the reason that the world wants to hate Christianity, the reason that the world wants to, to quiet us down is because we make them see their own sin. And they don't want to see that. That's why they accuse us of doing wrong. But we are called to live such good lives and love so unconditionally that even though they accuse us and even though their own sin is is fast in their face, one day our battle might bring victory where one glorifies God where one repents, where one turns his or her back on the way of the world and turns toward the cross in salvation. See, that's our battlefield. Our battlefield is not the big picture of this giant field uh, sown with wheat and weeds. Our responsibility is when the weeds are around us to show them Jesus, to reflect Christ to them to help them see through the cloudiness of political correctness and glorify God now you might ask how can we live a Christian life in a way that might make an example or, or shine the light on Jesus. And, and number one is follow the example of Jesus. John 13, uh, 13 through 17 uh, talks about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus, who is the teacher, becomes the servant. And he says in verse 15, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. We are called to follow Jesus' example. Jesus' example was a life of sacrifice and love, but it was also a life at times of confrontation where Jesus would stand against the way of the world and he would say, point blank, that's wrong. We have the ability to do that today. By being like Jesus. Verse 17, the end of that says, You will be blessed if you do them, the things that Jesus did. So how can we live in the, in the face of political correctness in, in the midst of an evil world? Number one, follow the example of Jesus. Number two, acknowledge that you sin and then repent. Recognize I'm not missing an R on you. It's not supposed to be your sin. And recognize that you sin. Recognize that you take action. You do something purposeful in sin. It is your responsibility. And you need to repent. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have failed. All of us sin. All of us are the you. John, uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So, we need to, number one, follow the example of Jesus. Number two, acknowledge that I sin and repent. Number three, read and do what the Bible says. That's our, that's our guidebook. I remember as a scout having the scout handbook. And I remember our scoutmaster saying, This is the book. This is what you need to know. This is where you'll learn stuff. This is is where you'll accomplish the process of becoming a scout. And they would take us through the scout manual. And we had to read it and we had to know it and we had to understand it. Inside there was how to uh, tie a tent so that it wouldn't float away in a windy day. 
and all the knots you needed to know. And even how to swim. Now they take you out to the water to teach you that, but it was in the book. The scout manual was the key. This is our key. We need to read and do what the Bible says. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the world and so deceive yourselves. Uh, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Live it. Matthew 4, four says, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Everything we need to, to know to live a successful Christian life, how to live one and how not to live one, is right in here. It doesn't matter if you like the King James or the New International Version or the Living Bible or the English Standard Version or the Revised Standard Version or you read it in German or you read it in Swahili or you read it in Hindu. It doesn't matter. Truth is truth. And it's the truth that will set us free. And it's the truth that we need to take to others in that day-to-day battle amongst the wheat and the weeds to bring weeds to freedom. God can actually transform a weed in that, in that field of life from being a weed that chokes to a wheat that grows and feeds. And lastly... We need to allow God to change us. We need to not only read the Bible and acknowledge our sin and repent and do what Jesus did, but we need to allow God to change us. And he say, God, take me and do with me what you will. Break me if you need to break me. Teach me. Help me. Change me. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 says, this is God speaking, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you, I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. See, that's God acting on us. But we have to be a willing vessel. We have to open ourselves up to him. We have to say, God, please do this. Take my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Put a new spirit in me. In Ephesians 4.24 says, Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We did an entire sermon series early in the, earlier in the year about taking off the old self and putting on the new self. Allowing God to transform your life. As Romans says, by renewing your mind. That's how we're going to make a difference in a world infested with political correctness. And I'm talking about the wacky political correctness. Not things that are that are appropriate in society, that are still called political correctness, rightly so. Just societal correctness, just humanity correctness. We shouldn't go around yelling names at people on the streets. But when a child is sent home because he wears an American flag t-shirt on May 5th, and told that he's a bad person because he's offending someone, that's just not right. Only by living these four points will we rise above political correctness and make a positive impact for the kingdom of God. I've been using that term a lot uh, over the last few weeks, and, and I'm hoping that it's sinking in. The kingdom of God. You might say, well, John, the kingdom of God isn't, and isn't here right now. It, it's, it's to come. The kingdom of God is yet to come. In a sense, that's true. But wherever we are, we who have the spirit of God, the kingdom of God is present. 
wherever two or more of us are gathered together in prayer, the Spirit is there also. Wherever we utter the name of God, the kingdom of God is present. So in a sense, the perfected kingdom is not here. The, the, the old Eden has passed away. The new Eden has not come. We are living in the midst of sin and evil and unrighteousness, political correctness. But we can make a difference by living and loving and sharing and caring like Jesus did. That's the challenge for us today. In the midst of political correctness, to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Don't, don't, don't waste energy fighting against the political correctness that, that so permeates the world. Fight against the evil that's behind it. And, and raise up new believers... One person at a time for the kingdom of God in eternity. If your child's school says they can't wear American flag t-shirts, don't go buy them something with American flag on every piece of clothing they wear just to stick it to the man. Okay? Your child doesn't need that. Just get them some nice clothes. But tell them every moment of every day, hey, there's nothing wrong with the American flag. There's nothing wrong with the United States of America. It's filled with a lot of good people. Just because your school says you can't wear an American flag, let's not sweat it. But let's remember, God's in charge. See, it's got to come back to us as parents to teach our children. Mommy, mommy, why can't I get that Wonder Woman lunchbox? The school says we can't have superheroes. Okay? But you know what? We serve the best superhero of all, Jesus Christ. And never forget that. Just as Kathy was teaching the kids today, that they can make an impact sharing the word of faith through their own childlike manner. We can make a difference sharing the word of faith one person at a time for the kingdom of God. So, yes, political correctness has is, is, is run amok. And, and uh, you know, uh, I was reading something where it says uh, Republicans are blaming the Democrats for, for political correctness run amok and the Democrats are blaming the Republicans for political correctness run amok. I'll just blame them all. Uh, this is not a Democrat or a Republican or a conservative or a liberal issue. This is an issue about our children learning the truth. And remember, they have to learn it from us. And you have to stand up for it each and every day. Amen.